Well, it's a privilege to be uh, with you this evening and to share with you in this uh, initial conference. We've been uh, praying uh, for this conference at uh, Martin Road as we meet for prayer and uh, in our own prayers at home and trust that uh, the Lord will encourage us as we come under the sound of God's precious word. Um, Brother James said that Elson is from Minneapolis. I, uh, I want to make a slight correction. He's actually from this area. He's on loan to Minneapolis. So the folks in Minneapolis should be grateful for uh, the generosity of folks in Michigan in lending him to them. I want to have you turn with me to the, the book of Psalms and Psalm 90. The 90th Psalm. It's a psalm from which um, we often hear quoted uh, at uh, funerals. Uh, in fact, I think the Church of England in their uh, funeral handbook has made uh, reading from Psalm 90 mandatory. And um, of course, you know, not all of Psalm 90 is beautiful. Um, so in, in some of the readings, they're kind of uh, Photoshop the hard part and uh, stick with some of the more poetically elegant structures of Psalm 90. Uh, Psalm 90 is also very familiar because uh, those of you who are familiar with your hymn book, uh, you know that uh, Isaac Watts, from whose pen you have about 17 hymns, I think, in the Hymns of Truth and Praise, uh, has one uh, called, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, based uh, on Psalm 90. In the prayer, uh, uh, our brother remembered that uh, the message of the gospel would encourage those that are believers already and that it would persuade those who do not know Christ as Savior. And that is really true, isn't it? Because the preaching of the gospel uh, is uh, something that really refreshes the heart of the saint. C.H. Spurgeon, the great preacher of England, used to have uh, student preachers who would spend time with him over the course of years. And uh, it is said that Spurgeon would instruct his young preaching students that young men, when you get up to preach, be sure that you always preach the gospel because the sinner needs it and the saint loves it. And this evening, it is my prayer that uh, I'll be preaching the gospel to myself as I stand before you this evening. And that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, that you would often find yourself preaching the gospel to yourself. Because we should never miss the fundamental facts of the gospel. Because it is at the heart of all the living we do as Christians. Uh, you can read through the epistles of Paul and you will find that he often brings us back to the heart of the gospel. And from there he then gives instructions on how we ought to live. He would say, don't you know that you've been bought with a price? And therefore, glorify God in your bodies. The clear implication is 
that one who has not been bought with a price cannot glorify God in their bodies in the way in which Paul is uh, communicating that instruction to the Christian. So we need to do that as Christians, you know, to come back, come back to the gospel, come back to some of these words that we sang earlier this evening, just as I am. If you are a believer this evening, that's how you come, isn't it? If you come to the Lord at all, it is just as you are that you come. And if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus and you're here, take it to heart that you're here by God's appointment. And it is just as you are that you will be able to come to the Savior for the first time. Let me read Psalm 90 with you, if you will follow along. I'm reading out of the King James uh, translation. Follow in whatever translation it is that you have uh, with you. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto thy children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us, yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. We trust the Lord will bless the public uh, reading of his word and give us help and understanding as we look into it uh, together this evening. <clears throat> the psalm very nicely divides into three sections. At least uh, as I looked at it, that's how I saw it. But you may find four sections, and uh, I won't quarrel with you on that. But uh, uh, I want to look at it with these three sections uh, this evening. Uh, so we will begin at uh, where the psalm begins, which is by pointing us to God and his character in verses 1 and 2. And then uh, beginning at verse 3, running all the way through to verse 11, you have man and his days. And then at verse 12, uh, there is a prayer that the psalmist makes. And uh, I titled it, Man Under God's Mercy. 
starting at 12 and going through verse 17. So God and his character, verses 1 through 2. Man and his days, 3 to 11. And man under God's mercy, verses 12 through 17. The little title, your Bible most likely will have it, says that it is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. What exactly was going on in Moses' life and experience that um, caused him to reflect and to think and to write in the way that he has, we are not told. But uh, Moses, the man of God, being a servant of God and a leader of God's people, as they came out of Egypt and as they were led to Canaan, uh, we know from biblical record that Moses did attend a lot of funerals in his day. A lot of them died, perished in the wilderness. It is very likely that um, after attending a lot of these, you know, <laughs> making his way to a lot of funeral homes, he began to think about the, the reality of death. And um, as he begins to think about life, living, death, dying, his thoughts go back to God himself. And uh, he, in thinking about God, in this meditation, he thinks of God as eternal. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth. Creation is old. And, you know, you can have debates among scientific minds about the young earth or the old earth or the very old earth and uh, you, can, you can say there are millions or there are billions but the reality still exists that before the mountains were brought forth, before they came into existence, he was. He was not brought into existence, the mountains were. Before anything was, he was. The eternity of God. God is eternal. Before anything was, he was. And after everything is over, he will be. He was in eternity past. He will be in the eternity that is yet to come. And elsewhere in the book of Psalms, the psalmist would reflect on the very nature of the created universe, fine-tuned as it is, well-maintained as it is. They were very aware that this thing is fading out. The psalmist would talk about the fact that God who made these things in the beginning will one day fold it all up like a garment. Yeah. So as Moses looks at the finality of human life, as how in weakness and in frailty man dies, his mind goes to the one in whom is life. Uncreated light. And John would begin his wonderful gospel that way, wouldn't he? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In him was life. He was not given life as we are. 
In him was life. God, you have been our dwelling place. Uh, the word is also translated, and properly so, shelter in some places, or refuge. Moses, the same man, when he was addressing his people, the children of Israel, in his farewell address in the book of Deuteronomy, and I think chapter 32, he would remind them, the eternal God is our refuge. Same word. And underneath are the everlasting. So for Moses, a transient man, a man who was here only for a time and then was gone, as he saw hundreds upon thousands of people come, occupy the scene for a moment, and then is gone. He, as the man of God, is remembering this fixed truth. God, the eternal one, is our dwelling place. He's our shelter. And this should have been particularly relevant, I think, to a people who are homeless. Remember, if you, if you read your Old Testament and you're familiar with your Old Testament history, you know that as, <clears throat> as the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they were headed to Canaan, uh, they were going camping every night. You know, they were, not, they were not living in a fixed dwelling. They camped. And uh, as, as the group moved, they took the camp down, pitched it in a new place. So they were a homeless bunch. They were actually looking for home. And to such a people who are dying as they are heading home, Moses is reflecting, he's meditating, but I'm sure that along the way Moses may have even told them these things, you know. If you think you're homeless, you are. And your true home is the eternal God. So, <clears throat> if in 3 to 11, man and his days, really look at the fact that man is transient, he is frail, he is weak, he is homeless. The eternity of God is given not simply as a contrast to the transience of man, the impermanence of man, the frailty of man. The eternity of God is given as a true and only answer to the problem of man's homelessness. You know, winter is coming, and uh, Michigan can get some pretty fierce, nasty winters. And as you drive around, you probably have seen it. You know, some poor man sitting under a, a bridge somewhere with a cardboard box with something written on it to the effect of homeless and hungry will work for food or some such thing. And you know, on a particularly cold day, you drive by and it, it really grabs you. It, it does me. That's a very sad thing, particularly when the wind chill is 40 below or something. You would say to yourself, man, homelessness is a real problem, you know. But there is another kind of homelessness that is even more pitiful than that. That is the homelessness, homelessness of the man who was created by God, the eternal God that Moses is talking about. Created by the eternal God for fellowship with him. And that man, created by God, for fellowship 
in sin, rebelled against God, and he became homeless. He is like the prodigal in the Gospel of Luke, in the story that the Lord Jesus told, of the man who was in the father's house and he got tired of the father's house and the father's rules, and he broke fellowship with the father. And he simply took the goods that was coming to him. That's what he said. You know, I, I cannot wait around here, Father, until you die to get my inheritance. You know, time is passing. There is fun to be had. There are places to go, people to meet, fun to be had. Give me the portion of my inheritance coming to me because for him to get his inheritance, he had to wait until dad died. So he said, you know, I want what is duly mine, but I don't want you. I don't want to be in your home. I don't want to hold communion with you, but I want to have the stuff that is mine because I'm your son. Does that sound anything like humanity in 21st century? Because we want to use all of the benefits that are ours because we are created by God with a good mind, healthy bodies, opportunities that we can pursue. We want all of the gifts but we want to have nothing to do with the giver of every good and perfect gift. That man is the homeless man. If tonight you are one of those who freely and lavishly enjoy the generous and magnificent gifts of God, but would have nothing to do with him, Oh, my friend, your condition is far worse spiritually than the condition of the man under some bridge on a cold winter's night, physically homeless. And for the homelessness of the lost son in Luke 15, the true and only solution was to do what the son did. He said, I will arise and I will go to my father. I've been over the years away from home enough times that I know what it feels when I'm homesick. whether it is that I've gone 300 miles or 10,000 miles, when I'm homesick, there is one thing that cures me of my homesickness. You know what it is? Go home. So Moses reminds us in this psalm that the eternity of God the refuge that we find in this eternal God is the true and only answer for the homeless sense, the homelessness that has come upon every son and daughter of Adam because of sin and of rebellion. If you're familiar with the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, Paul gives a magnificent description of the man outside of Christ. And he gives that description with that introductory phrase, at that time. Then he says, we were certain things. We were dead. We were hopeless. We were outside of the commonwealth of Israel. We were without God. And uh, one commentator kind of paraphrased the whole bit in this way. He said, we were godless, Christless, hopeless, 
stateless. Everything good that you can imagine, you were without it. So Moses reminds us, as he does his own meditation on the realities of life, that the only true home for a man, for a woman created in the image of God is the home that he finds in fellowship with the eternal God. No substitute will do. Nothing else would do. Because they all, sooner or later, in the words of Jeremiah, would prove to be broken cisterns that hold no water. They're poisonous streams and springs that ultimately kill us. And whatever it may be that we look to, to take the place of it, whether it is fame or fortune or relationships or money, it does not matter. Whatever we put in the place of it will sooner or later expose its own inadequacy. God, you have been our dwelling place, the eternal one. He is also a holy one. Because as you look at uh, man and his days at the middle of the psalm, you'll find that uh, the fact that they are dying off like they are doing has a lot to do with the fact that they have sinned and he is holy. And that the anger, the wrath of God is really directed against man and woman who sins. Now, I wish I had the time, but I don't. But I can simply give you the little encouragement to do this. You'd want to really look at Psalm 90 and go back and read Genesis 2 and 3. And you will find how much of what Moses is really dealing with in this psalm really goes back to the very beginning of human history. Because in the second chapter of um, Genesis, we are told that God created man he created the mountains, but he also created man. He created man out of the dust of the earth. And there is some language about dust in Psalm 90, isn't there? Return. And in chapter 3 of Genesis, we are told that um, uh, Satan comes into the picture as a serpent and has this conversation with uh, Mrs. Adam, who tried to entertain the salesman. And um, there's some quibbling about words, because in chapter 2, God's instruction is that the day that you eat of this particular tree, you shall surely die. Okay? So Eve was very faithful and said, you know, this is what the Lord told us. And then Satan in chapter 3 says, you shall surely not die. And part of the curse that God pronounced in that context is you are dust. To dust you will return. Look at verse 3. Thou, now the King James says turnest, and I think it can properly be translated, you cause man to return to destruction. It's the same word that is back in Genesis and 3. 
So I think, you know, all through, and I think, you know, we, when, when we uh, kind of uh, Photoshop the hard parts in Psalm 90, we miss this connection. Why is all this death? Why is all this frailty of man? Why is all this futility? All these things that we find about man's existence here on earth. Why is it so hard? Why is it so fragile? Why is it so frustrating? Why is everything so vain? Why is it that in the, in the, in the language of the preacher, in, in Ecclesiastes, why is that everything feels like we are just grasping after wind? Why is it? And Moses, I think, in those verses is helping us understand that there is a relationship between sin and death. This was not God's intention. This is the consequence of what has happened as a result of sin. So the fact that people die comes from it. Now, I'm not saying that every death is a direct consequence of some specific sin. But the reality of death in the human experience according to the word of God, is the result of man in rebellion against God. So God is eternal. God is holy. And the sinful, sinfulness of man is exceedingly sinful because God is indescribably holy. God is not only eternal and holy, but uh, God is angry about human sin. Now, that's not a very popular idea to talk about God being angry because we all like to have this benevolent kind of grandfather kind of God, you know, who, who just kind of uh, uh, is there at my beck and call and is very facilitating toward me in all that I want and... Uh, because that's the kind of uh, idea that we often get about God these days, you know. God is just kind of my, kind of a helpful chum next door. And I think, you know, in thinking about God that way, we have run the risk of missing the gravity of the glory and the holiness of God. There's a Puritan writer who once noted that, um, you know, men of the Bible, men like Isaiah and Peter and Paul, these men must have been extraordinarily sinful or, or we have lost our sense of the holiness of God. Because to come into the presence of God with that kind of casualness. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that you've got to always be saying thee and vow in addressing God. I mean, if you do, that's, that's fine. But if you say you, that's okay too. But you don't want to come into the presence of God in the same kind of uh, ease as you would walk into a a Lions game tomorrow or Monday night or whenever. Martin Lloyd Jones is with the Lord now, an Englishman who he used to say, you know, when you come into the presence of God, you should never forget the fact that you're coming into the presence of a king. And you should come, as it were, with your hand over your mouth. God is eternal, God is holy. And God is angry about sin. And you can see it in the Old Testament. You know, the kind of judgment that Moses is describing in verses 3 through 11, you've seen them in much uh, colossal proportions in the Old Testament. You, you think about the flood. Oh, that was a time when God was really angry about sin, wasn't it? 
He wiped out the whole earth, except for just a handful of people who found refuge, a dwelling place, a shelter in an ark. Or you think about uh, Exodus, when Israel came out, there was serious destruction. When God, in judgment, visited Pharaoh and his people. Or Sodom and Gomorrah. So there are these historical moments when God intervened, expressing his displeasure, his anger, his wrath at human sin. And none more so clear and uh, unmistakable as on the cross. When God, for us in our place, judged his own son. When Jehovah's rod, as the hymn writer says, woke against him. There was that orphaned cry that came from the lips of our Savior. My God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? God is eternal. He is holy. He is angry at human sin. His wrath is expressed. And I think, you know, in verses 3 to 11, Moses is telling us how maybe in not such pronounced way, in the ordinariness of everyday life, in the reality of the death of human beings, God is quietly giving expression to the fact that his righteous, holy anger is incited against and in the face of sin. So, what about man and his days? There are some things that Moses reminds us in these verses that we will do well to remember ourselves. Well, one of the things that he says is that um, our days are few. Our days, you know, if I may borrow the phrase from Ecclesiastes, our days under the sun. On this arrangement that we have here, they are few. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we, we um, maybe without even thinking, we give expression to this. You know, you, you see a young person you've seen maybe 10 years ago, and then you kind of see that person again, and uh, you say to the boy, you know, it's been, it's been a while since a boy. You've really, you've really grown old since I last saw you. And the implication is you have grown old and I haven't. You know, I've... I'm yet to say to a young person, you know, I have really grown old since I saw you last, you know. No, it's always you who are growing older. And I have accumulated enough birthdays uh, that I'm starting to really sense it. I'm, I'm getting mail from AARP all the time, and uh, two weeks ago I succumbed and I became a member, you know. Brother James told me that he's a card-carrying member now. It's coming, friend. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you are six or 60, we are all getting old at the same rate, aren't we? Now, the young people aren't getting any old, older any faster than all the rest of us. Men's days are few. The psalmist elsewhere prays this. He says, O oh Lord, make me know my end. And what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting or frail I am. Have you prayed that lately? Make me know my end. Several of us sitting here have most of our days behind us under the sun. We have fewer of them in front. I used to think about the other way for a long time, you know. 
I can remember for decades, you know, when my father was living, whenever he was my age, he was very old. <laughs> now he is no more, so now I'm, I've stepped up in line, you know. Our days are few. And our days are fragile. They're frail and fragile. It doesn't matter how many pounds you can lift. Not long ago, I talked to a man who, um, who did the uh, Iron Man triathlon. I didn't even know what was involved in it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty grueling. Some two and a half miles of swimming and... Uh, 117 miles of biking and then, then a marathon. All to be done under 17 hours. A guy did it. And now he's looking for the next mountain to climb. And he told me the story how he got into this. He was not all much into athletics and all of that, but at age 45... He had a quadruple bypass. And I think it made him aware of how frail he was. And I don't think running a triathlon or an Ironman triathlon changes the verdict that frailty is a lot. Our days are few. Our days are fragile. Look at verse, um, verse 6, end of verse 5. In the morning, he's talking about our life, our days. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes, it grows up. In the evening, it is cut down. Our days are fragile. And some of you in this room tonight are probably in the morning, in the early dawn of life. Um, you know, maybe older people would come around to you and say, you know, you have your whole life in front of you. That's the morning, you're just flourishing. And some of us are getting close to the evening. We can see the evening shadows falling. But the fragility of the thing is, the thing that comes up with such beauty and splendor and strength in the morning, by evening, it's gone. Like, like grass. And I don't think Moses is talking about the kind of grass that you are familiar with, which is, it's got underground sprinkler system. And it just looks like it's going to be here forever, you know. He's talking about grass that comes up in dry, arid, Middle Eastern life. And you can see the thing come up in the morning and by evening the sun has completely scorched it. In Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, and if you have the time, it'll be worth reading that. It'll be a good read, as they say, you know. Because the preacher begins with addressing the young. He says, you know, remember your creator in the days of your youth. And then he moves on very, very quickly to talk about the days are coming, evil days are coming, and he's talking about really difficult days when everything is starting to fail. You know, dentures are failing, ears are failing, eyes are failing, desire fails, everything fails. Morning, evening, all compacted 
into a very small segment. Man's days are few, they are fragile. And man's days, few and fragile days, are full of frustration. Anybody uh, can agree with that? Anybody been frustrated lately? Hmm. Look at verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten. That's, that's 70. By reason of strength, they be four score. That is 80. Yet is there, now the King James says, yet is their strength or its glory, its boast, is labor and sorrow. And pe people ask this of one another, you know, hey, you, you've, been, you've been at this for a while. What have you got to show for it? And, oh, well, look, look at, you know, that's 3,200 32, square feet there, you know. And look, look, at, look at my lawn, man. It's impacted. There's not a crabgrass in it. I've got this driving machine that's parked in my garage. Looking pretty good, huh? And Moses, the man of God, says, you know, even if you've got 80 of them and then all of the other attending circumstances, what have you got to show for it? At the end, sorrow and trouble. Full of frustration. Verse 7 says, we are consumed by your anger, and we are troubled, dismayed, terrified by your wrath. Man's days are few, they're fragile, days of frustration, and they are also futile days. I go back to the preacher in Ecclesiastes, and he keeps going back over that refrain almost monotonously. What does he say? It's all vain. It's all vanity. It's all empty. It's vain for you to rise up early, sit up late, and eat the bread of sorrows. It's vain. Why spend your money for that which is not bread, and labor for that which does not satisfy. Ten times in Ecclesiastes, the preacher says, these things that you go after, whether it is knowledge or wisdom or wealth, doesn't matter, it's all like grasping for wind. The word vanity or emptiness occurs 39 times in Ecclesiastes. All the days of his vain life, he concludes, they pass like a shadow, fragile, few, frail, frustrating days, futile days. And then we cannot miss, can we, the words of our Lord Jesus when he asked the question, what shall it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and lose his soul. Eternal God, the only dwelling for a homeless man. Man, in his days under the sun on earth, few days, fragile days, frail days, frustrating and futile days. Well, I wish I could say, well, have a good day. 
That's not a good day, is it? That's a bad day. Nothing about that is good. Thankfully, Moses doesn't end there. He then brings before us this wonderful possibility that man who is under the wrath of God because of sin and therefore now facing few fragile, futile, frustrating days can really come under God's mercy. So he prays this at verse 12, teach us to number what? Our days. Not, not, not our centuries, not our decades, not our months, not even our weeks. Teach us to number our days. That's a wise man's prayer, you know. Because there, there was a story that the Lord Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12 about a man who was not very wise in this regard. Because Jesus inserts that story in responding to a man who wanted him to speak a word to his brother and settle a dispute in the family about inheritance conflicts. Remember that story? And the Lord Jesus inserts this account, this, this parable, about a man who was a farmer. Maybe in contemporary language you can say he was, uh, he was an investor in uh, uh, Wall Street. That's, that's a street somewhere in New York, right? Yeah, he was, uh, he was in investment banking. Maybe a hedge fund guy. And uh, the account says that, you know, the, the crops that year was just phenomenal. And 20th century man would say everything he touched turned to gold. And it was doing so well that he was now facing a new problem. His new problem is, what am I going to do with all of this? Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to break this down. I'm going to build it up. And uh, I'm going to store it up. And I'm going to sit back. And I'm going to say, time for a party, you know? Life is a party, man. You've got to enjoy this stuff. Because I'm all set. Inflation, deflation, recession, depression, it doesn't matter. I've got it made. That's what he said to himself. Until the monotony of his own speech is disrupted. And another one speaks. Says the Lord Jesus. God said, tonight, you fool. Your life is going to be required of you. Whose will all this be then? And the word for your life will be required literally means it will be asked back. Oh. This thing about which I said it's my life and I can live it any way that I want to, after all, was not my life. It was a given life. And the one who gave it to me has every right to come and ask for it back. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, because if you don't do that, according to the Lord Jesus, that is the most foolish thing you can ever do. Teach us to number our days so that we may have a heart of wisdom. Do you have a wise heart tonight? And along with that prayer comes the following. He says, then return, O Lord. He's crying out now. The Lord, who is, he said, has been our dwelling place, he's now saying, return, Lord. Now, in verse 3, there is a return. 
you will cause man to return to destruction, to death, to the dust. Now he's using the same word and he's saying, Lord, return to us. So that instead of this frustration and futility, we may rejoice. That's possible, you know. It doesn't have to be that your days are lived and end in frustration and futility. God's design is something far different, far more glorious than that. So the psalmist gets a hold of it and he says, Lord, return, help us to rejoice and be glad all our days. Satisfy us, verse 14, satisfy us with your mercy. If God's anger is kindled, and if his wrath is boiling at the reality of human sin, now there is mercy to be had with the same God. What an amazing, amazing thing this is. That the God who cannot look at evil because he is of such pure eyes has judged your sin and mine in his blessed Son at Calvary. So that God provided for himself a just basis on which every repentant sinner can be justly forgiven and received favorably. You know, the hymn writer put it so well when he said, Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That is the mercy of God. Have you ever come to him for mercy? Because if you are not under his mercy, be sure that you are under his judgment and his wrath. So that is how the psalmist ends at verse 17. If the beauty and the splendor and the strength and all of that that human life possesses under the sun is all passing and few and fragile and temporary, here is something that is imperishable and permanent. If you have come under the mercy of God, because of Christ and what he has done, then, says the psalmist, the beauty of the Lord our God can be upon us. That's a permanent state. It begins here and continues on into eternity. And this evening, my prayer for each of you, as it is my joy for my own heart tonight, that the wrath has been absorbed by another who stood in my place so that mercy can be extended to me, a sinner, who had no claim to it. There was nothing that I could bring to claim it. And I want to close as I read these words from Augustus Toplady's hymn that we often sing. He put it into words when he said, Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. What a glorious gospel this is that the Lord Jesus came to bring to us and procure for us by his own death at Calvary. That we who are homeless because of our sinful condition 
may find our true and happy home, our only home, in him who is the eternal God. So that having come out from under his wrath and judgment, we may come under his mercy and his beauty may be upon us for time and for eternity. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the gospel, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for the fact that by the simple preaching of that gospel, you've been pleased to save men and women through the centuries and now in our time. And for everyone who has come to personal faith in the Lord Jesus and what he has done and thus have passed from death to life, we give thanks. And for our friends who may be in the audience who have not made that personal move from self to Christ, from sin to the Savior, from self-righteousness to his righteousness, we pray that tonight you will grant them the grace, the wisdom to number their days, that they may apply their hearts to wisdom and do the wisest thing they could do tonight, which is to come to God and uh, say to him humbly and penitently, God, I agree with you in all that you say about your son and all that you say about me that I am a sinner and that Christ died for me and I receive him as my own and only Savior. Just as I am, I come. So, Father, it is the echo that comes from all of our hearts as we close. O Lamb of God, I come. We ask it in his name. Amen.